Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, the most famous woman in history. We know her as the legendary lover who used power and beauty to seduce two of Rome's greatest leaders, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. But there was a darker side to this legend, the forgotten story of a cold-hearted killer. At the behest of Cleopatra, Mark Antony had her sister dragged from the temple of Artemis, and there, the young Arsinoe was put to death. Over the past 2,000 years, this dark side of Cleopatra has disappeared. But now, her trail has led here to Ephesus. A vast Roman city in what we now call Turkey. In a 2,000-year-old tomb, scientists have uncovered the skeleton of a young woman. They believe she was a murder victim. She died because she dared to cross someone even more powerful than herself. Her own sister, none other than Cleopatra. Could this skeleton be the first forensic evidence of Cleopatra's story? This is a story of power, lust, and sibling rivalry. takes us on a journey to two of the great wonders of the ancient world. What's inside this tomb reveals Cleopatra as you've never seen her before. This is the portrait of a killer. The journey starts here, in Turkey. In the 1920s, archaeologists were exploring a tomb here in the heart of Ephesus, once a glorious Roman capital, ten times the size of Pompeii. In a sarcophagus filled with water, they found human remains. The skeleton was small, with thin bones and a slight frame. They appeared to be the remains of a young woman. But the custom here was to bury the dead outside the city walls. In 500 years, there had only been four exceptions, and all of those were men of great importance. So who was she? And what was she doing here? The archaeologists had no idea who they'd found or her importance, and they resealed the sarcophagus. The identity of the body remained a mystery, until archaeologist Dr. Hilke Tour was drawn to the forgotten tomb while excavating Roman remains nearby. In the 20 years she'd worked at Ephesus, she'd never seen anything like it a mysterious octagonal tomb on the most important street in the city, the Street of the Heroes. She was determined to find an answer to the riddle. Hilke decided to enter the tomb. It would be a momentous decision. So Hilke, is this the entrance to the tomb? Yes, this is the entrance. And I can go in here? It's yes, safe? yes, 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 okay. yes, I, I think so. <laughs> The chance that the skeleton would still be there, nearly a century later, seemed remote. But what she uncovered would take her on an extraordinary detective story to the dark heart of the legend of Cleopatra. Right. What's that? A, a, a barrel vaulted chamber. Nice workmanship. It's beautifully made, isn't it? Lovely masonry. It's just held together by its own weight. Wow. So, what did you what did you see to just describe what the, what the scene was like um i was very excited and i crawled through this um, small entrance there and came uh -huh. in and i saw the bones right 
the uh, long bones from the from the legs, and they really were uh, partly in the one niche and partly in the other niche. I immediately thought we now have at least the skeleton of the owner of this grave chamber. How fantastic, you know, that there was someone in here, obviously of some kind of significance, mm -hmm. and to then immediately wonder, you mm -hmm. know, who, mm -hmm. why, why was somebody worth this? Mm -hmm. What was their story? It's great. Determined to discover the identity of this mysterious skeleton, Hilka had little to go on. It was incomplete. She decided to search ancient records for a woman important enough to be buried in such an unusual tomb. In the Roman accounts, she found a reference to the horrific murder of Princess Arsinoe, Cleopatra's sister. Please, please go in, come. A forgotten but bloody chapter in the legend of Cleopatra. In the city of Ephesus, at the behest of Cleopatra, Mark Antony had her sister dragged from the temple of Artemis, and there, in this holy place, the young Arsinoe was put to death. These words, by Roman historian Cassius Dio, describing the murder of Cleopatra's sister, were written 300 years after the event. So was it just a legend or the truth? If Cassius Dio was right, and if Hilka had indeed stumbled on the bones of Arsinoe, then this was a huge find. The first ever remains of anyone from Cleopatra's family Proof not only of a shocking murder, but also the first forensic evidence that Cleopatra was a ruthless killer. If this was Arsinoe, how did she end up in a tomb a thousand miles from Egypt, where she was born? To find the answers, I need to cross the Mediterranean to Cleopatra's homeland. temple of Karnak. By the time Cleopatra came to the throne, this place was already 2,000 years old. The golden age of Egypt was past. Its future was hanging in the balance. In 51 BC, Cleopatra's father died. He had four children. He left the throne to be shared equally between his eldest son, Ptolemy XIII, and his eldest daughter, Cleopatra, aged 18. Also, and in the custom of Egyptian royal families, both rulers, brother and sister, were to be married to each other. But behind the scenes, they were a family divided, and there was one issue above all that split the brothers and sisters, the new and emerging superpower of the age, Rome. The Roman Empire was expanding across the Middle East. And, for the first time, Roman troops had established a foothold in Egypt. So the ruling dynasty here had a big decision to make. Should they try and resist or make some kind of alliance with Rome? Both strategies involved a sizable risk. By siding with the Romans, they might provoke open rebellion in Egypt. But resisting the Romans could involve going to war with the most powerful military machine on Earth.
Cleopatra wanted to be Rome's friend, but her brother, Ptolemy XIII, disagreed, and he was supported by their sister Arsinoe. They believed it was time for Egypt to stand up to Rome. The family argument rapidly got out of hand. It so happened that the king of Egypt, whose name was Ptolemy, and who was but a boy at the time, was engaged in a vicious war with his own sister and queen, Cleopatra. With the support of those loyal to him, the boy king expelled Cleopatra from the kingdom and sent her away. Cleopatra was banished from the Egyptian capital, Alexandria. She found herself in exile. But Cleopatra wasn't finished yet. There was one sure way to get back at Ptolemy, and that was with the help of Rome. Cleopatra was her father's daughter, and he was a friend of Julius Caesar. He had written in the royal will that if there was conflict over the succession, Rome should be the impartial judge. In 48 BC, Caesar arrived in Egypt with a small force. He soon found himself mediating in the family feud. Cleopatra knew she had to get to Caesar before her brother and she had one key advantage over him. Cleopatra believed that Caesar might well yield to her charms, for she was a woman of surpassing beauty in the flower of her youth. Cleopatra decided to seduce Caesar, a move which would have fatal consequences for her brothers and for her sister Arsinoe. 2,000 years later, it's time to test the astonishing theory that this might be the skeleton of Princess Arsinoe. Armed with state-of-the-art forensic science, Dr. Fabian Kantz is brought in to examine the skeleton. If the bones from the octagonal tomb are male, the theory will collapse at the first hurdle. So Fabian, what can you tell from a first analysis of the skeleton? From the first analysis, I think, or I'm sure that it was a female. I can show you for comparison uh -huh. from yep. other skeletons. Two pelvics, one from a male and uh -huh. one from a female. Oh, right. Well, you can, yeah, there's clearly, that's a much bigger space there, yeah. isn't it? And so the female pelvis has well, basically got room for a baby. Yeah. Right. And if you take the pelvic bone from the skeleton from the octagon, you can see it's a white, white angle. And right. so it, from the morphological point of view, it must be a, have been a female. OK, so it's a, it's a woman. But can Fabian discover anything else from the bones? The next, after the sex, what you try to establish is the, the age at death. And in this case, you can see on the long bones that they are still not completely grown right. because the epiphysis and the diaphysis are not fused together. Right. Like, so the bones start out in, in pieces and then gradually grow yeah, together they grow and become this, one? they grow in this gap. I show it to you with a, with a uh -huh. fully developed adult skeleton where even this gap is, is completely right. gone. Yeah, that's quite, that's quite clear, isn't it? Yeah. So this... This skeleton here is, is female, and how young? I would say between 15 and 17, maybe 18. So just a youngster. We also know Arsinoe was Cleopatra's younger sister, and that Cleopatra was 18 when she came to the throne. So this too fits with Hilka's theory. So the bones are the right age and sex to be Arsinoe. But is the skeleton from the right period? Next, 
Fabian carbon dates the bones. The tests show this is a body from the period between 200 BC and 20 BC. I think this is striking because the carbon dating was consistent with being a scene whale. The carbon dating too matches the dates of the Cleopatra story. And there's more. What about just the general appearance of it? You know, what does the, the, the skeleton as a whole suggest? It's, it's very delicate. It's very thin. So it's, it's very, do you mean it's uh, of a small, slightly built person? Yeah. A petite person? A petite person, yeah. So our skeleton belongs to a young female of slender frame. History suggests that Arsinoe's older sister, Cleopatra, was slim too. Famously, she used her size to smuggle herself back from exile into the royal palace. Here's what the Roman writer Plutarch has to say. Cleopatra sailed into Alexandria in a little skiff and landed close to the palace just as it was getting dark and she was able to enter undetected. She rolled herself up in a bed sack tied with a thick cord and had it carried indoors to Caesar. In this way, she was already in Caesar's bed, alone with him in his quarters, ready to reveal herself at the moment that would have the most impact. It reveals the clear and calculating mind of Cleopatra a woman able and willing to do whatever was required to get her what she wanted. Caesar was 52 years old. She was only 22. The story of Cleopatra's seduction of Caesar is at the heart of her romantic legend, but it was also a calculated act of betrayal. Others have written long before I that her hair was mussed with so deft a touch as to give the air that she had been tearing at it. Her face, the picture of sorrow, and yet not a tear had been spilled. And how she pleaded to the Roman leader, mighty, mighty Caesar. Caesar. Birth come I have been driven from my father's throne. I shall be in exile forever, unless your guiding hand restores me to my rightful destiny. And therefore, I, a queen, beg at your feet. Hearing her speak but a few words, Caesar was instantly captivated, such that he spent the whole night with her in infamy. <laughs> By getting into bed with Caesar, Cleopatra was in effect stabbing her brothers and her sister Arsinoe in the back. Not expecting to see his sister within the palace, the boy king was filled with wrath. He tore his diadem from his head and cast it to the ground before rushing out to his people, crying out that he had been betrayed. The young king felt Cleopatra had sold out to Rome, leaving him and his country to pay the price. In modern day Ephesus, Fabian is still working with an incomplete skeleton. Last summer, he decided to go back into the tomb with a slim hope of finding new evidence. He struck lucky. In this niche over the door to the grave chamber, there have been some bones. It turned out that there's uh, human bones and they, that they belong to the individual from the grave chamber. The chance to find additional bones in this 
grave was nearly nothing, I, I think. It was a great day. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So now the skeleton is nearly complete. But there's one big problem. The most important part of the skeleton remains missing. The skull. Well, here at least, our modern-day archaeologist, Hilke Tour found an answer in the archives. In the 1920s, the skull had been taken from Turkey back to Germany. It was lost in the chaos of the Second World War. But before its disappearance, an archaeologist had recorded its dimensions. Cryptically, he revealed another clue as to the identity of the occupant of the tomb. The skull, long and with a low forehead, reminded him of others he'd seen in Egypt. By a stroke of luck, his precise notes, photos and measurements of the skull survived. Using the latest scientific technology, a world-renowned British facial reconstruction team believe they can use this evidence to rebuild the skull in virtual reality. Well, this has been a, a challenge, but it's been quite interesting to take in these two-dimensional images and recreate a 3D model within the planes created by the images. And we can take a template skull of a similar age, sex and ethnicity into the space and then alter that to fit the morphology, the shape that you can see of the skull on the images. So what might the 3D reconstruction reveal about the identity of its owner? The eye sockets are quite large in relation to the upper face and that's something that's quite common in children. It's also something that's common in young females, but I think proportionally the cranium suggests this is the young adult. The virtual skull confirms Fabian's findings that this belongs to a young female, and so perhaps our princess Arsinoe. If this is her, can the skull tell us anything about her looks? It's difficult to call a skull beautiful, but certainly it's symmetrical, um, it's balanced, it's got quite delicate features, and those are all things you would associate with a beautiful face in a woman. So far, the age and proportions of the skull are consistent with what's known about Arsinoe. But we can now go one stage further. Using the shape of the skull and the bite of the upper jaw, the team can estimate the shape of the lower jaw, recreating the mouth and muscles on the face. We all have the same muscles in our face and they all have exactly the same origins and they're exactly the same attachment points. It's just the proportions of the skull that make a different face shape. We can then look at facial feature detail so we can work out the prominence and position of the eyeballs and then we can put on big structures like the neck because we can see where the neck muscles attach. We can look at the bones on the uh, edge of the nasal aperture and the nasal root here between the eyes to tell us about the prominence and width and shape of the nose. She had a very prominent nasal root, kind of like uh, ancient Greek sculpture, that kind of classical um, nose shape. She's got quite a distinctive nose, which is very straight. And I think it's something that now we find aesthetically pleasing. It's a beautiful feature. So the owner of the skull was young and classically beautiful. If this is Arsinoe, it ties in with ancient accounts of her sister Cleopatra as a beautiful queen. 2,000 years ago, back in Egypt, Cleopatra's looks may have conquered Caesar, but sex with the Roman was seen as treason. Troops loyal to her brother and sister took up arms in the siege of the palace in which Caesar had made his headquarters. War beset Caesar on every side. Missiles fell upon the palace and battered the roofs. Oh! 
all the while the king by his side. He took some consolation in holding the boy hostage. If he could not return the fight with firebrands and missiles of his own, then at least he could hurl at the Egyptians, the head of their own king. Barricaded inside the palace complex, Caesar sent for reinforcements, but they would take weeks to arrive by sea. Caesar and Cleopatra took desperate measures. To draw the Egyptians away from the palace, the Roman general set fire to the ships in the harbour. Consumed by fire, they sank without trace. The flames in turn set fire to the city. The wind fanning the flames until they streaked across the roofs as fast as meteors. This inferno drew the Egyptians away from the palace as they rushed to rescue the city. Caesar did not waste a moment. Seizing the opportunity, Caesar led his bodyguard to the mouth of the harbour. There, towering up from the centre of an island to warn approaching ships of rocks and reefs, was the seventh wonder of the ancient world, the lighthouse of Pharos. The lighthouse of Pharos. Caesar described it, soaring in height, a work of unimaginable construction. It stood on an island at the mouth of the harbor. And whoever controlled this island controlled the traffic of all ships into Alexandria. So in all haste, Caesar dispatched his troops to seize the island and the great lighthouse itself. The 300-foot lighthouse had a distinctive eight-sided tower. From the top, sentries could see for 30 miles out to sea. Workmen stoked giant braziers to keep the lighthouse torch burning. It was an emblem of Cleopatra's family and was about to take centre stage in an epic chapter of this story. battle raged, the young princess Arsinoe stole a moment to turn the tables for the Egyptians. She made a daring escape from the palace. Free from Caesar's clutches, Arsinoe was brought to the leaders of the rebel army. Once again, the Egyptians had at their head a member of the royal dynasty of the Ptolemies. The rebels proclaimed Arsinoe their queen to lead them in rebellion against Caesar and Cleopatra. Back in Ephesus, Hilka and her team are searching for further clues to link their mysterious skeleton with Egypt over a thousand miles away. Their investigation turns to the tomb itself. The heroes' tombs in Ephesus all carried symbols which told the story of who was buried inside. 2,000 years ago, everyone would have known who they were. Today, we have to decipher our tomb like a secret code. Only the burial chamber and its octagonal base remain intact. But there is one further piece of the tomb that is preserved, the 
because the original archaeologists took it back to Vienna. Nearly 20 feet high, it's still only a third of the height of the whole building. It reveals a vital clue about the tomb's owner. These pieces have been found right beside the octagon. It must have been something like a torch, probably, where you can put up a, a light in the top of this little column. So it looks like a bundle of papyrus leaves, you know, from, from Egypt. As an image, as the type of this column, everyone would recognize at once papyrus bundle and Egypt. So the stone imagery strongly suggests the tomb's owner was Egyptian. But to decode the building in full, the team would have to rebuild the whole thing it survives only as 170 scattered stones. Austrian archaeologists and colleagues of Hilkatur have painstakingly been piecing together fragments of the tomb. They've scoured the site for those fragments, hoping one day to put it all together again like pieces of a giant jigsaw. A team of engineers is brought in to scan each and every stone into a computer and rebuild the tomb in virtual space. This is just kind of a, a heap of, of, of stones right here. It's kind of a virtual stone yard. We have plenty of objects looking quite similar and we have to figure out where they could belong to. Then the scanning reveals another clue invisible to the naked eye, a tiny diagram that gives away the shape of the tomb. This potentially is a drawing of the base, the columns and the roof on top of it. Nobody knew about this drawing up to this summer. Armed with clues like this, the tomb begins to take shape and we can now see what it would have looked like 2,000 years ago. high and 13 feet wide, the most prominent tomb in Ephesus. And most important of all, it had eight sides. Hilka searches in vain for tombs from this period with the same peculiar octagonal shape. Once again, she turns to the story of Cleopatra and her sister Arsinoe and uncovers the story of the battle for the Pharos lighthouse. Hilka is immediately struck by the eight-sided tomb's resemblance to the lighthouse. The symbol of Cleopatra's dynasty, the Pharos was the most prominent octagonal building in the ancient world. This is a eureka moment. The Pharos lighthouse and the destiny of Arsinoe were about to become inextricably linked. The Queen of Egypt, still an adolescent, now took on the might of Rome. With Caesar pinned down on the island of Pharos, her troops launched a surprise attack, catching him completely off guard. by his thick robes and being pelted by the Egyptians. His cloak, being purple, made for an easy target. He might have perished miserably had he not thrown off his clothing and succeeded in swimming further out to sea. escaped with his life and staggered back to Cleopatra at the palace. The hero of Rome had been defeated by Arsinoe, barely a teenager. The Pharos lighthouse 
now became a symbol of her famous victory. When Caesar's cloak was hoisted above the battlements, the message was clear. Princess Arsinoe had shamed the might of Rome. There was an incredible moment when it looked like there might be the start of a new dynasty. If things had continued along this path, a path Arsinoe might reasonably have hoped for, we would now remember the legend of Queen Arsinoe, not Cleopatra. But the alternative future didn't last long. The rebels began to argue among themselves. Caesar used the breathing space to bring in reinforcements from Syria. He launched a counterattack. Caesar had promised to restore his lover to the throne, and now he was to honour his word. The young Ptolemy was pursued by Roman troops and, weighed down by his gold armour, he was drowned, trying to escape across the Nile. Cleopatra's first rival for the throne had been dispatched without her having to lift a finger. Caesar had done the work for her. Arsinoe was taken prisoner. Cleopatra's greatest rival, her own little sister, was in her grasp. Caesar was victorious, but he didn't take over Egypt. He placed Cleopatra, in whose name he'd fought the war, back on the throne. By tradition, she was to marry her last surviving younger brother. He was around 12 years old. As for Princess Arsinoe, she was taken to Rome in chains. A captive of Caesar, she must have felt a world away from her moment of glory. In 46 BC, Caesar celebrated his Egyptian triumph in Rome. Top of the bill of the entertainments was an effigy of the Pharos and a parade of the Egyptian prisoners captured in Alexandria. At their head was Arsinoe. Caesar had a special treat in store for the crowd. The custom was to take the main prisoner at the end of the parade and strangle her to death. Imagine what that must have felt like for Arsinoe. Did she know that that was what was intended for her? And whatever else she was, whatever else she might have done, she was just a young girl. But in Caesar's eyes, she was the teenage rebel who had taken on Rome, and this would be her just desserts. When he returned at last to Rome, a glittering festival was held to honor Julius Caesar. Arsinoe was to be paraded along with the other captives. It was a spectacle which had never before been seen in Rome. A woman, and one once considered a queen, now in chains. Behind her, Caesar paraded a burning effigy of the lighthouse of Pharos. Once the embodiment of her greatest victory, it was now a symbol of her humiliation. The octagonal symbol that Hilka is now convinced is the key to the code of her tomb. To the onlookers, Arsinoe looked more like a child than a rebel leader. To 
execute barbarians was one thing, but to strangle a young princess as a circus act was quite another. The triumphs delighted the spectators, but the sight of our Arsinaway, led out amongst the captives, displeased them exceedingly. Caesar stunt backfired. It aroused a great sympathy amongst the people. To be certain, it was for that that her life was spared. The crowd forced Caesar's hand, and he had to spare Arsinoe. But he could never allow her to return to Egypt. Instead, he banished her. A thousand miles from Rome, and a thousand miles from Egypt. To Ephesus, in modern-day Turkey. Ephesus was a vast imperial capital, Rome's gateway to Asia. Try and imagine what Ephesus was like 2,000 and more years ago. This was no Roman backwater. This was one of the most exciting and cosmopolitan capital cities anywhere in the known world. A glittering jewel that attracted the great and the good, the famous and the infamous. Everybody who was anybody came here. To them, Ephesus was a place of pilgrimage and pleasure. But for Arsinoe, it was a prison. For the rest of her life, home would be a religious sanctuary, the Temple of Artemis, another ancient wonder of the world. In ancient times, the building was visible from miles out to sea, even at night. And this is what Princess Arsinoe would have seen as she approached by boat. She was just a teenage girl, but she knew that she would be spending the rest of her life here in the care of eunuch priests, and that she would never see Alexandria again. These ruins might not look like much today, but 2,000 years ago, this place was the reason for the fame of the city. This was the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Historian Pliny tells us that the temple alone was 425 feet long, 225 feet wide, with 127 columns, each 60 feet high, supporting a massive roof. It was here, 2,000 years ago, Cleopatra's sister came to seek sanctuary. Dr. Sabina Ladstatter knows just how important Artemis was to political exiles like Arsinoe. It was a common practice that you may ask for political asylum. If you got the asylum here, you could stay here as long as you want. People lived here for years, for decades, and they were safe because the Artemision had its own administration and had its own jurisdiction. So nobody was allowed to interfere in the Artemision. Arsinoe's coup had failed, but her life had been spared. Under the protection of the temple and the watchful eye of Rome, her days as a rebel were over. But at least no one could harm her here. Or so she thought. Just two years later, in March 44 BC, the man who had spared her life, Julius Caesar, 
will stop today. With Caesar dead, Arsinoe's future was thrown into jeopardy. For Cleopatra, there was no one left to curb her ambition to be sole queen of Egypt, even at the cost of her own family. With Caesar gone, what would she do? The bloody answer came within weeks. She had her husband, co-ruler and last little brother murdered. Only Arsinoe was now out of Cleopatra's reach. Then the Roman Empire in the east got a new governor. His name was Mark Antony. His seat of power was Ephesus, the city of Arsinoe's exile. And he used the city as a place for his expensive personal pleasures. Even in Ephesus, with the vast reserves of wealth the city had to offer, Mark Antony's licentious lifestyle soon left him broke. He had enemies on his borders, in Iran and in Armenia, and his wars were expensive. It wasn't long before the new governor's lifestyle meant that he too had to look across the sea to the wealth of Egypt, and Egypt meant Cleopatra. Antony summoned her to Tarsus in modern-day Turkey. But Cleopatra played hard to get. If she did come, it would be on her terms. She was older now and more savvy. She had received several letters from Antony. Still, she refused to come. Then, as if in mockery of them, she sailed to Tarsus to meet him. The people poured from the town to catch but a glimpse of her. The throng streamed away till at last, just Antony was left seated alone on his chair. She herself lay under a canopy of golden cloth, adorned like Venus, while beautiful boys stood either side of her in adoration of their queen. Mark Antony held the key to a prize that until now had been beyond Cleopatra's grasp, the life of Arsinoe. Antony was now as valuable to Cleopatra as Cleopatra was to Antony. The honeymoon period in the year that followed became legend. Every day they would hold even more lavish feasts for one another, Cleopatra constantly flattering him, meeting out each day some fresh new delight, some enticing little way to charm him, releasing him neither night nor day. She watched him as he exercised himself in arms. She drank with him, she played at dice with him, she hunted with him. But behind the romance, both knew they had an agenda. Antony needed the resources of Egypt to pay his debts and fight his wars. Cleopatra craved absolute security, and that meant removing her last remaining rival to the throne of Egypt, her younger sister, Arsinoe. But at the temple of Artemis, under the care of priests, the princess was surely no longer a threat to anybody, least of all Cleopatra. Stung once in Alexandria, Cleopatra saw it differently. Back in the present, there's one final question for Fabian to answer. How did the lady in the octagon tomb die? I have seen hundreds of skeletons in Ephesus, more than 500, and we have just two juveniles in the whole sample. And this is astonishing because it's very unlikely to die in the juvenile age. She has been treated well her whole life. 
I think she was quite healthy at the time of death. We also don't have any, any sign for, for the, why she died. And there's also no sign of any kind of long-term degenerative illness. No, there's no sign of, of long illnesses, even not short illnesses. There's just perfectly smooth proportion bounce. Right. This was not an individual that had to do hard labor work. So it seems to be somebody who lived quite well, had an easy life, and then unexpectedly in their teens, gone. Yeah. The Roman sources were in no doubt. Arsinoe died a sudden death, and they knew who was responsible. At Tarsus, a deal had been struck between Antony and Cleopatra, and Arsinoe was to find out what this meant for her. At the behest of Cleopatra, Mark Antony had her sister dragged from the temple of Artemis. And there, in this holy place, the young Arsinoe was put to death. It was not only a shock in Ephesus, it was a shock in Rome and everywhere, you know. It was unbelievable this, that somebody interferes in a sanctuary, and especially in the Artemision of Ephesus. It was the biggest crime in this period. The carbon dating of the bones, the sex, build and age of the skeleton at the time of death, and the fact it belonged to someone of high birth, point to one thing. Experts are now convinced that this skeleton is the first forensic evidence of Cleopatra's family ever found. The shape of the tomb, its similarity to the pharos, these are all parts of a code, and the whole of it comes together to make a complete picture. At last, we can solve the mystery, beyond doubt, of who this skeleton actually is. None other than Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoe, Egyptian rebel, queen of Egypt, murdered on the sacred ground of the holy temple of Artemis by Mark Antony, on the orders of his lover. But of course, what we haven't known until now is what she looked like. Although the forensic team have only an incomplete skeleton, using our virtual template, we can now rebuild the skull. Pilka and Fabian thought the skull was lost forever. So I'm dying to see how they'll react. <laughs> and we've been looking for the skull for a long time. For, for and we don't have the real thing, but we've got the next best oh. thing, which is a very exact oh. replica. Oh. Cool. Super, oh. super. And this oh. is where it should be. May we touch it? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> it's, 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 it's of course. No, it's ah. <laughs> cool. This is really cool, yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's really like looking in her face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is quite another thing to have the skull of of, of her the in skull. your in your hands. Yeah. This is this is a really uh, enormous big feeling. <laughs> hmm. Wow. <laughs> well, it was worth bringing that. Driving away home. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Super. The forensic team are convinced they've proved beyond doubt that these are the bones of Princess Arsinoe. But rebuilding the skull has unlocked an incredible secret about her ancestry. Until recently, Cleopatra's dynasty was thought to be Greek, 
European, Caucasian. But some scholars now believe Cleopatra and her siblings had African blood. Could the answer be in this skull? The distance from the forehead to the back of the skull is long in relation to the overall height of the cranium. And that's something that you see quite frequently in certain populations, one of which is ancient Egyptians. Another would be um, black African groups will also show that characteristic. Um, this one certainly looks more white European, but it has got this long head shape. It could suggest a, a mixture of ancestry. Our revelation backs up the controversial theory that the princess, and therefore her sister Cleopatra, also had African blood. Eleven years after Arsinoe's death, Antony and Cleopatra made a bid to take over the Roman Empire. But their forces were annihilated. The ruthless queen, who had dispatched her own brothers and ordered the murder of her sister Arsinoe, was now left with no option but to kill herself. By killing her sister, Cleopatra ensured that her last rival was dead. But she also ensured that there would be no more descendants of her father's line to do battle with Rome. Cleopatra thought she could use the Roman Empire, first in Julius Caesar, then in Mark Antony, to keep her on the throne. But she was wrong. Egypt became just another province of the Roman Empire. Although Cleopatra succeeded in murdering Arsinoe, she couldn't erase her entirely from history. So only one last question remains. What did she look like? Now that we've remade the skull of the lady from the octagon, we can finally rebuild her face. Lost for 2,000 years, this computer-generated image shows what she would have looked like. Scientists are convinced this is Cleopatra's sister, Princess Arsinoe. This may be as close as we'll ever get to seeing Cleopatra in the flesh. The picture it paints is a very different one from the romantic legend. Not just a cunning politician, a beautiful queen, or an amorous seductress. This is the portrait of a killer.